Uh, good afternoon, Ghent. Is this the way to pronounce your name? That is correct. <laughs> right. Listen, thank you for making the time to meet with me today. We're going to spend about 10-15 minutes to talk about you and your contribution to Dev Library. Woohoo! All right, my favorite subject. <laughs> you, before we, we do anything else, I'd like for our viewers, because this is going to be on YouTube, I'd like for our viewers to know a little bit about you. Do you have three keywords or maybe three numbers that would define you? Oh, okay. Uh, one is a hyphenated word, mad scientist. <laughs> um, two, we'll go with uh, entrepreneur because, you know, we've got the, the labor, the French theme a little bit. And then uh, I'll end with a number, the number fee. And if you don't know what that number is, that's on you. You have to go know about the number fee. <laughs> I guess you can use your favorite search engine. I'm not going to say which one uh, to, uh, to figure out a bit more about fee. It's Ask Jeeves. Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> By the way, question for, for you and for our viewers. Do you know how many search engines existed before Google? How many? Good question. Ooh. Well, what is your guess? Uh, three. It's a bit more than that. <laughs> well, there, see, that's excellent marketing. <laughs> there, were, there were actually 18 search engines oh, before wow. Google. Today, we want to talk about uh, open source projects. Uh, hmm. And you have contributed many of those to their library, and uh, quite a bunch of those have been selected uh, to the Dev Library website. We'll put the link down in the description. We'd like to talk about a little bit about those projects and what led you to work on TensorFlow, because most of what uh, you work on, if I'm not mistaken, is using TensorFlow JS. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I have been a uh, dare I say, a app developer at heart with a computer science degree. Uh, <laughs> it's always been uh, fun to dig into uh, math and you know computer science, but it, in the end, uh, you know, I don't want to write papers. I want to build things that actually affect my life, and that's brought me directly into websites early on. Websites going. Uh, you know, while my teachers were giving me classes on making sure that I, I've learned Haskell correctly, um, I was building, <laughs> I was building, uh, ASP pages and then before ASP.net. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. And then that, of course, you know, if you're, you're a pragmatic person, you end up in mobile development where I've strongly landed for a while. And I work with the best company in the world, uh, you know, for mobile development, which I am now part owner in infinite red. And we've gone through a myriad of different kinds of levels of technology, native Ruby on top of native and then ending with things like JavaScript. Uh, actually ultimately controlling those experiences. And I've fallen in love with the world of, you know, the ubiquity of JavaScript. So TensorFlow being one of the coolest things in the world, I decided, hey, they're doing TensorFlow, but now in JavaScript. So TensorFlow.js, I can actually run my models on the client side. I can put them on edge devices. Um, I'm jumping in on this pretty hard. So uh, we've we've really been delivering quite a bit in the world of TensorFlow JS. I'm actually uh, uh, been on quite a few Google shows. Been a contributor back to TensorFlow JS the in, in the repo, as well as I actually wrote the O'Reilly book, uh, learning TensorFlow JS. Very nice. Is there anything that surprised you as you explored and became more proficient with TensorFlow.js? Anything that surprised you? By the way, it can be in a positive way or a negative way. I'm curious either way. <laughs> I, I have to say, the, I think that we're, we're always been like these machines, the, the AI is going to require a supercomputer. And then you have it work on a browser and a phone. <laughs> And you're getting almost, you know, 30 frames per second on a phone uh, doing visual AI. Just uh, very hats off to the team that's optimized, tapped into the GPU, tapped into WebAssembly, uh, create all these different backends so that 
it could actually be dynamic and land on different platforms and still, you know, not fall over. So the performance, uh, that's been the surprise. You know, I, I was expecting it just to be able to do it and not to do it well. It does it well. Uh, in fact, two of your projects that I played with a little bit earlier today to prepare for this interview are rock, paper, scissors and uh, yes, a recognition yes. of facial expressions. And I think for the rock, yes. paper, scissors, you can actually try it live. Uh, you have a demo uh, app or web app link. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more, a bit more about these two projects or any other projects that you've yes. yeah, contributed absolutely. to? Uh, what? One of the weird things that I wanted to see... Have you ever seen the movie War Games? No, I have not. Okay. Uh, I actually just recently watched it again. And one of the great things that happens here is there's a scene in War Games where the computer is learning. And I kind of wanted to see that. As a matter of fact, most famously, it actually learns from playing tic-tac-toe. And uh, what's great about it is I want to see the the idea here. As a computer programmer, I have the idea in my head. And then I code out that idea, and then the thing does what I've coded it to do. And if I don't think of it, it doesn't think of it. But um, with the rock, paper, scissors example, it actually was beautiful to me because I have a model that's seen no data whatsoever. And so it's just created. It's not seen any information. And what happens is you can actually ask it, is this rock or paper or scissors? And that's from a data set uh, by uh, Lawrence Maroney. And it was a wonderful data set, but it's terrible. It fails. It falls over. It thinks everything's scissors or it does this or that. It just basically, uh, it's based on randomness on the way it's set up. So it really doesn't know anything. And then you can take a look at the data. Then basically give it a test. You know, here's information. Uh, I'm going to give you 80% of these questions, and then I want you to learn from that. And then I'm going to test you on the other 20%. And then so you just give it, you know, this is what rock looks like. This is what rock looks like. This is what rock looks like. And it does it in your browser. It's not going off to any server. It does it in your browser thousands and thousands and thousands of times, like flashcards, right? And then you get to come back and say, okay, what did we learn? And then you say, what is this? It says, oh, that's rock. This is paper. That's scissors. And then I say, okay, let's surprise exam, a pop quiz, turn on the webcam. And then what are you actually seeing? You know, is this rock or is this paper or scissors? Or, or like as they do, you know, over there, this is scissors. That's a mean scissors right there. The thumb coming out like that, but we do scissors like this. And then you actually get to see how how much it's learned and it's all been sitting on your machine the entire time it didn't go off to server and you got to watch it train in a matter of seconds uh that's just a beautiful sort of aha moment for for developers who who exist in this sort of world of i have to tell you where this finger is or i have to tell you where that is and we have this insane control and here's a problem that none of us could probably code ourselves but in seconds it coded for itself. It figured out how to look at this and do that. And we just simply gave it the data and the test and the training of that. And I think that's a real nice moment for everybody coming into TensorFlow to say like, wow, you know, I just saw this go from nothing to something right on my screen. Any challenges that you've encountered when you wanted to build machine learning models? You make it sound very easy <laughs> and, it's, and visually it's very appealing as I can attest when I yeah. play with what you've built, any challenges that you've encountered when building maybe this model or other models? Yes, very much so. I actually have a very funny tweet that I did a while ago. So when I first tried to do the rock, paper, scissors, so um, here, here's the, the hard part. Taking information, that whether it's video, audio, you know, uh, the set of, you know, uh, just like when the next full moon's going to be or a fizz buzz data, you know, like whatever you have there and you're going to kind of put it in there. It's figuring out how to take that and put it into data that patterns could be found in. And when I first did the rock, paper, scissors, I did, uh, I was trying to get this large group of data and I had the RGB channels wrong. So it was actually grabbing the R channel, the, the red from one picture, 
putting it over the the green and the blue of other pictures, and it looked crazy. <laughs> it looked like pop art. And so I had a mistake in my code in just getting the data encoded. And so I actually put it on Twitter, and that's actually one of the first uh, communications I had with Lawrence is uh, I said, look at this. And he said, I want that. And I want to print it up and put it on my wall <laughs> because it's his data set. But it looked really cool when it's, you know, like suddenly changed. You should yeah. sell it as an NFT. What do you yeah. think? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I wound up fixing it and, you know, I was sad to see it go. But I went back and I made a high resolution version for Lawrence. Uh, <laughs> And I sent it to him on Twitter. I'll have to send you the link to the thread. Please do. But there's the moment of mistake <laughs> where I'm just looking at the hands and they are not right. <laughs> what would be your advice for someone who starts playing with either machine learning or TensorFlow? Someone who's maybe a programmer and yeah. has heard about machine learning and AI for ages now, but it's, it's still a bit afraid yeah. of getting into. And what would be your, your piece of advice? Don't don't let any eggheads push you around. Uh, you don't need a PhD. Now it's true you used to, you used to need a PhD. Then for a while you had to have a master's in order to go ahead and be hired in um, AI and in machine learning. The the barrier to entry is decreasing. The market and the pragmatic side of it has been growing exponentially. I'd say don't be uh, dissuaded. Look at dev libraries, look at open source, look at the stuff that's happening. Uh, I have seen it accelerating more and more cool things. You're seeing people hook it up to, uh, do music videos to, to play Street Fighter, you know, with their actual hand movements and stuff like that. The things that are coming out now latch onto that. Get your passion project idea and then go after it. Yes, you might end up because uh, it's early, you might end up a little bit deeper into some of these places, but that's a great way to learn. That's a great way to learn. You know, if you have something that's really interesting, you have a good community, and then you have to go a little bit deeper here and there. That's the safe place to kind of learn. That's how I think all the best sort of development projects I've ever done in my life have been. I have a reason why I need to go a couple layers deep and take a look at linear algebra for a minute or something like that. And it's not scary then. You know, it's only scary when you don't know what it's for. Conversely, do you, is there any worst piece of advice that you've heard around you or on Twitter or in our tech industry that you feel, <laughs> oh, really, we should not say this or we should not think that way? Yeah. Uh, it, it's the people shutting people down. Uh, it's saying you need a PhD. I wrote a blog article on Hacker News uh, there's a really good one. Well, I wrote this one called uh, Machine Learning Zero to Hero. And it had so many views. It had so many people like getting interested. It says, why do you want to be interested in this and what's coming in here? And in the comments, there was one person who said, oh, you can't think of things like that. That's not exactly how it works. And then went into specifics and identified this and that. And you could tell there was a lot of their personal life coming out, right? Now, fortunately, a whole bunch of people came back and responded to that comment saying, that's not what the purpose article is. That's not what this is. That doesn't even sound like something that would happen to someone getting started. All kinds of stuff. So, uh, you know, my, I'd say ignore the haters. <laughs> There's an interesting article. Uh, I don't advice. know if you've seen it a few years ago. I think a couple of years ago by Paul Graham, the co-founder of Y Combinator. Mm -hmm. He has a, a, an article called, an essay called Haters. And the interesting perspective that he oh. has is showing how haters seem to be the exact uh, minus sign of the fanboys or the fangirls. Mm. So whatever you do, they will mm -hmm. hate, just like a fanboy or a fangirl would just love whatever you do, even if you say wrong things. Yes. And when you see it that way, where there's right. this lack of distance and you know, critical mind is just hating what you do, what you say, just for the sake of hating, it allows you to just realize, yeah. okay, this person is you know, set on their, on their mindset and not, not going to change. So I like your advice of ignoring it. Yeah. Any piece, go ahead. Yeah, you know, the critical thinking skills are fantastic. They really are. And they have their place and they have their time. And when you're just starting out, that's not the place or the time. A couple more questions for you. Any piece of Google technology that is exciting you going forward? Anything you'd like to play with or, yet, or that you'd like to see come in? Uh, the advancements of what's been happening with TensorFlow.js have not slowed down. So the 
trick coming in with that is all the things that they're building, all the auto ML things, um, all the new backends for TensorFlow.js. There are a lot of stakeholders. And that just means that new bells and whistles will be showing up inside of websites uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, sometimes, and I hate to say this, there's this sort of Death Star staring down every Google project. And you wonder if you're going to grab onto something and and then it might not be the thing that's around next year. Uh, that's a very valid fear. Uh, seeing so much buy-in makes me very happy. Instead of that, you get the other side of it. Plenty of user adoption, plenty of new features, plenty of cool new things. So uh, I'll say that that's what I'm very excited about because it seems to be accelerating. Very nice. Any last words you'd like to share with fellow developers? Uh, I would say that quite specifically, um, we are entering a new world. You probably have been in the developer world for a while or, or brand new to it, but you've, you've sort of seen this hurry up and hustle kind of mentality. You might have seen get your code out or some of these other kinds of things. I'll say with the AI revolution that's coming in and it's entering into your emails, finishing your emails for you, it's in your app, putting fun filters on your face, all these things, um, the... Here's my great tip for you. It's not about hurrying up anymore. It's about being creative and being the most uh, human that you can be and bringing humanity to these cool new features. We don't have to sit there and code thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code. We have to actually architect what it's going to be like when it's done. And if you're like me, that's a very awesome thing that, to look forward to. And that's what I'm seeing. Um, be more you. Be more human. Bring humanity to AI. Very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time and for your contributions. You got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.